Let's start it up. Another coffee session. We have got a very special guest. You know, it is me, myself, and David, aka Bam Bam. And today、I'm、we、here. are with Carl Steinbach, who is an incredible being all around. I'm just、wow. going to say that <laughs> right here, go out on the limb. But he also has been doing a lot of stuff with the data infrastructure at LinkedIn. And that's why he's here right now. I know you've got a lot of cool stuff that you, you're doing. So I'm excited to jump into it, Carl. And I would love to maybe start with how you got going on this path. Yeah, so、um, kind of a, I guess in a way, kind of a weird story. So,、um, you know, I majored in computer science when I was in college.、Uh, the, the school I went to at the time didn't offer like a single course on databases. And when I was there, you know, I assumed that since they didn't teach databases, the databases must be like a done topic, not worth the research anymore at that point.、Uh, and then、um, my first job out of college was working at Oracle. In the server tech division on the, the database server.、Um, and I quickly learned that databases were not just an interesting topic, but really you know, a fascinating topic and、um, you know, an area which really brought together a bunch of different topics in computer science, like systems, algorithms,、um, languages. So it's really sort of the, the nexus of all of these, these things that individually I'd found very interesting as an undergraduate.、Um, the irony of it is that as soon as I left, The school,、uh, they added a database course and they,、um, I think they hired Stonebreaker as well. So、um, suddenly, you know,、oh, we're, we're hot once again. And that kind of coincided with、um, the emergence of、um, MPP, you know, analytic databases in the early aughts.、Um, and then、uh, around 2009, I joined Cloudera, which some of you may remember as like this、um, one of the, the two major vendors of、um, Hadoop and later Spark. Um, I was one of the first 10 engineers there, and I joined at a time when、um, you could pretty much work on anything you wanted to work on as long as it was one of these Apache projects that, that the company was trying to commercialize. So,、um, based on my database background,、um, I decided that、uh, Hive was the natural、um, fit for me.、Um, mm. And I also at the time thought that、um, if, this, if this platform was going to have any commercial potential, it was going to be by making it look more like a database.、Um, at the time, there was a lot of Uh, you know, NoSQL was very big, sort of as a as a slogan, if you will.、Um, you know, people love to chant that, and、um, I think that people were sort of blinded by the fact that this wasn't a very you know usable、uh, interface.、Um, a lot of people also were were sort of, I think, predicting the demise of the database, the demise of SQL,、um, and that turned into sort of a I think a knee jerk reaction against.、Um, Uh, SQL and, and, and this set of tools, right, that worked very well for people for, for 30 years.、Um, so, yeah, I would say that, that in the last maybe 10 years,、um, the theme of my career has been to make、um, offline analytics, and in particular, sort of like、uh, Hadoop and Spark、uh, batch analytics, look more like a database、um, in the good、oh, ways. So, by providing、um, a nice set of abstractions, you know, tables and views instead of files,、um, and A nice high level language instead of having to you know, use assembly language like MapReduce.、Um, and、uh, yeah, so that's, that's been pretty much what I've been up to.、Um, uh, starting at LinkedIn, I started a project called、um, Dolly, which is originally stood for like data access at LinkedIn, but since then has sort of、uh, broadened a little bit.、Um, and I guess the, the quick description of it is that we're sort of building a, a postmodern database by taking the The monolithic you know, database stack and introducing levels of indirection and optionality at all the different layers. And most recently, we've been focused on decoupling、uh, the way that people express business logic from specific、um, execution engines. And we do that by、um, translating from one relational language to another relational language, and also by introducing a framework that allows people to write portable UDFs. So, with that, you can write. Super、uh, interesting. You can write a view and execute the view on、um, Spark or Presto or、uh, other engines. Can you break that down a little bit further about this yeah, translation yeah, yeah. between? Sounds like a compiler a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.、Like、so it's actually, yeah, so it's a、right. transpiler, actually.、Um, nice. Yeah. So,、uh, you know, I think if, if you sort of look at what's been happening、um, in industry over the last 10 years, 
uh, we're really taking sort of this this monolithic entity, you know, the the conventional database server, right, which had a very tight coupling between um, the storage layer where uh, you only had one storage format, right? And that meant that uh, in order to analyze data, you first of all had to load the data into your database. And that was a very uh, time consuming step. And also, you also had to sort of first negotiate with your DBA to make sure that there was space for your data uh, and that it's not going to you know, swamp the server. Um, and that's coupled very tightly to a specific execution layer that the database provides and one specific language, its own you know, flavor of SQL. Um, so, Basically, you didn't have any choices here. Uh, it, it is what it is. Um, and if you didn't like it, you know, tough, tough, tough luck. You had to go find something else. Um, so uh, Hadoop introduced, you know, this notion of um, uh, you can use many different formats, right? You can use many different uh, storage backends for that matter. Um, and all you needed to do was load your data onto the storage layer and you could um, figure out what your schema was at a later point, this whole notion of schema on read instead of schema on write. Um, and similarly, it gave you a lot of optionality in terms of the language that you wanted to use to actually analyze your data. So, uh, you know, 10 years ago, we saw this proliferation of different um, like relational languages, things like Pig Latin. Um, there were a bunch of different programmatic frameworks. Uh, you had MapReduce, which was like the assembly language uh, that the people at that time used. Um, then later on, you had um, Spark, which was a much nicer, higher level API. Um, you also have things like Beam, uh, Cascading, Scalding, all, all of this different stuff, right? So um, suddenly, uh, you know, it was not just SQL. There were a bunch of different options. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's kind of the, the, the broad arc of how these things developed. Um, but one thing that, that remained the same was that there was still this tight coupling between a particular, let's say, programming API and language and the underlying execution layer. So if you are using Presto, you are using, you're writing Presto SQL and you're using the Presto engine to execute uh, your code. If you're uh, writing in Spark SQL, you're using the Spark engine to execute your code. Um, uh, and at LinkedIn, where uh, 10 years ago, there was a lot of um, evangelization about uh, Pig. Some of you may remember Pig, maybe some of you don't. This was Just a, a little bit. I know the yeah. name and I know it's related to the Hadoop ecosystem, but I never used it. So I'm not a fan of Pig. I like to say that Pig was like a science fair project at Yahoo that got out of control and uh, too many people adopted. So it was marketed as like an imperative uh, scripting language um, but really, it is declarative. It, and in fact, you can you can um, show that there's like an isomorphic relationship between Pig Latin and SQL. Um, but a lot of people adopted it. Uh, Pig Latin, you know, is tied to a single like engine implementation, the 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 Pig engine. Um, and over time, that Apache project. Um, suffered from sort of a, a, a lack of interest, right? A lot of the developers who had been working on it, um, you know, scattered to uh, better things. Um, and LinkedIn was stuck with a large corpus of Pig Latin scripts and, uh, you know, an, an aging engine. So um, the, the beauty really of this, um, you know, using a transpiler is that you're no longer stuck with just a, a single implementation. And instead of saying to everyone at LinkedIn, hey, everyone, let's stop all the good work that we're doing. We're just going to spend the next six months uh, manually translating, you know, 10,000 Pig Latin scripts into oh, SQL, yeah. uh, we can automate that process. Um, so that's one thing, right? The ability to automate migrations. But uh, another, I think, even bigger benefit is that um, it allows us to write views in SQL and actually execute those views in a variety of different contexts on top of a variety of different engines. And this sort of connects to another theme that uh, I wanted to talk about, which is um, taking you know, principles and practices from the world of software engineering and applying those to data engineering. So oh, interesting. Um, if you look at um, the way that, that people sort of manage um, data analytics logic, it, it's, it's sort of a, a world divorced from the rest of software engineering, at least up until recently, right? Like the use of source control was something that that uh, some people did, but not many. Um, uh, the way that you would actually reuse logic, right, uh, is um, 
a challenge, right? Some people would write UDFs, but oftentimes UDFs are tied to a particular execution engine. So at a, at a place like LinkedIn, where there's a lot of heterogeneity, you might have to have N different copies of the same UDF, one for each engine that's being used. And um, since there's, uh, you know, no sort of like well-adopted dependency um, mechanism, right? People would just end up copying a UDF jar file, you know, from one home directory to another. So you have a lot of things that are falling out of sync constantly. Um, and these UDFs, right, would often be tied to particular data sets. And you can imagine that as the schemas of these data sets would change, then the UDFs would break. So it was just this insane nightmare, everything falling out of sync. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I could go on about this, but I, I guess the, this is it, the you said so point, many good things there. Yeah, the, the meta level point is like, feel my pain. You know, it was a, it was an awful okay. situation. So, so uh, do you mind if we just break that down just a little bit? Because oh, I think please, you said some, please, some really interesting things. So one of the things is, I, and you kind of were articulating it, but what's what can we break down the advantage of decoupling the execution layer from whatever query language? Obviously, you mentioned that there's an advantage that because it can get messy real quick if you're working with lots of different I guess that, lots of different engines, but what you, you mentioned one, let me just, so I'm, I'm, I'm understanding. Uh, so you're not stuck to a single implementation, right? So you could generalize, you could extend it, right? Um, you can automate migrations. If I'm understanding that correctly, you could write views in different contexts. What else do you think, may, what other advantages does that bring? Well, let me talk more about the, the view use case because I don't think I yeah. really got to the, to the piece de resistance. Sounds good. Well. So, um, <laughs> In software, right, we have these nice dependency resolution mechanisms, right? So you could say that I want to depend on this library and uh, Gradle or Maven will go to Artifactory and it will pull it down for you and, and you know, everything's good. Um, in, in data engineering, you really don't have a dependency resolution mechanism like that, which means that reusing uh, logic written by other people is much harder um, and, you know, at LinkedIn, like the the best case scenario was that you would talk to your friend who was sitting, you know, next door and say, hey, do you have any good UDFs uh, that you can share with me? And then you'd, you'd copy them from one home directory to another. And obviously, like that doesn't scale. It's a manageability nightmare, you know, all of that stuff. So um, one of the observations that we made is that uh, views and, you know, for your listeners, let's just make sure that we're all on the same page about what a view is. So a view, right, is... Um, it's something, it looks like a table, but it's actually defined in terms of a query. So in a, in a conventional database, right, you can create a view using a DDL statement like create view foo as select star from bar. Um, and then subsequently people can select from foo and what the database is actually doing is rewriting your query against the query that foo is defined as. Or sometimes, I mean, a lot of people, um, Many people think of views more in the context of a materialized view where the database is responsible for actually um, running that stored query for you uh, on a schedule and yeah. uh, materializing or creating the data. But um, in the uh, context of our system, most of the views are virtual. So they are only evaluated at query time when someone queries the view, and then we actually execute the underlying um, query. But the cool thing is that um, if it's a smart uh, database compiler, it will actually rewrite your query in terms of the underlying query. And there are some interesting optimizations uh, that you can do like predicate pushdown or column pruning or stuff like that. So that's what a, that's what a view is. So there's but, some, there's, you can, there's some, if you can make it more efficient depending on how you or where and when you translate it and how you translate it. Exactly, exactly. But here's the other interesting thing about views. So um, in a conventional database, you have what's called the catalog service, right? And the catalog service is like a library of tables, but it's also a library of views. And in that sense, like in the view sense, it's really like a, a software distribution mechanism, right? A mechanism for enabling reuse because I can define a view in this centralized catalog, right? Which is really just a pointer to a query. And then other people can reference that query just by name. They don't have to, they don't have to know, you know, any more details than what the name of that view is. And subsequently, if I'm the owner of the view, I can change the definition of that view. Say that the underlying table changes, it adds a new column, right? I can modify that view definition then to project the new underlying column. And I can do so in a manner that doesn't disrupt any of the people who depend on that view. Right, and the people who are depending on it, they don't have to change uh, their reference to it. They don't have to do anything. Right, they just 
automatically get you know this new good stuff, right? So it's a much better mechanism than than what we had. Where uh, and, and let me also make the point that a lot of the things that you can express in views, you could also express in UDFs, right? But UDFs suck in comparison because we don't have a nice reuse mechanism there. We don't have a way of distributing uh, UDFs. We don't have a way of saying like, hey, here's a new version. Everyone needs to go and get on the new version. Just for clarity for our, our, our listeners, so let's differentiate, let's define a UDF, user defined function versus a view. So what, what are, I mean, concretely, what are the differences between them if from, I guess, the way that you're expressing it? Besides that one sucks and the other one is much better. <laughs> well, th yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely one good way of thinking about it. So um, let's talk about this sort of in the, in the context of SQL and a, a database or an analytic database like Presto or Spark SQL or stuff like that. So um, SQL is a declarative language. It's a declarative relational language. And um, the interesting thing is that like SQL is a combination, like standard ANSI SQL is a combination both of the, the core relational language, but also a core set of functions or operators. Um, so you have aggregate functions like count. Min, max, sub. mean. Yeah. Right, you have scalar operators like, um, you know, concatenate these two strings. Uh, and then you have also, um, you know, windowing functions that allow you to, to look at an aggregate in a sliding window. Um, so these really are, are pieces of imperative logic, right? Which um, it, UDFs in a sense like are your escape hatch when the core declarative language doesn't do what you need it to do. Uh, if you need to write something in an imperative fashion, if you need to express logic in an imperative manner, then you can write it as a UDF. Um, and there are that different makes sense. types. Yeah, so we mentioned earlier that there are different types of UDFs. Um, one type of UDF is actually called a user-defined table generating function. So it's a, a function that takes in a record and can generate you know, one or more records as output. So in that sense, actually, the distinction between a view and a UDTF blurs, right? Because a view is actually just a function that consumes a table and generates a table, right? And a UDTF okay. similarly, yeah. So in fact, you can write some views which are just um, you know, selecting uh, from one table and basically pushing those records through a UDTF and then uh, getting the result. Um, but the, the major disadvantage of UDFs in general is that they are black boxes as far as the um, query optimizer is concerned. Uh, so the, the query optimizer, as soon as it sees a, a UDF, it kind of like throws up its hands, right? Because it doesn't know what's happening inside of that black box. Uh, it doesn't understand what the relationship is between the inputs to that UDF and the outputs. Um, and that also has a major impact on lineage, right? Because at that point, all the, all the optimizer, the, the lineage engine can really say is, well, you know, I, I see these records, I see these fields going into the UDF, and I see some other stuff coming out. Uh, and for example, if you're doing impact analysis, or you know that um, some of the, the values that you were feeding in on Monday were bad, and you're trying to figure out like, okay, what is tainted downstream? You have to assume that anything coming out of that UDF could be tainted, right? Because you don't know you don't know sort of the relationship between input yeah, fields. And yeah, fields. I think that's a really important point. And I, I think at, a high, at the higher levels of abstraction with like, let's say ML applications where you can't reuse that logic, right? That makes it really difficult. Yeah, yeah well, definitely. And that was one of the and things lineage, that yeah. I was gonna ask about with these views, when you were talking about how they get automatically updated when things change in the database and you have that happening, how do you, ensure this reusability or the reproducibility when that happens like because i imagine if you ever wanted to go back to how the view was do you have a time travel option so you can go back and say okay well before all of this stuff happened where were we on you know whatever x day so that, that's a great question and in fact that's one of the details that i left out so th thanks for asking that so um you know, going back to sort of the theme of taking ideas from software engineering and applying them to data engineering. Um, one of the other observations we made is that if you look at a data set, you can kind of view it almost as a microservice, right? Like this data set, it produces data, like I can extract records from it. And this data set has an API, like a service API, and that API is the schema uh, of the data set, okay? But unlike a microservice, if I'm talking about just a table, I can't support multiple versions 
of the API on top of that table at the same time. So this creates like a really big problem because um, uh, if I want to evolve the schema, there are only some types of evolution that I can do in a safe manner without breaking downstream consumers. So I can't, for example, remove a column because anyone downstream who's depending on that column is gonna, is gonna fail immediately, right? Um, and yeah, if exactly. I, I can't you know, change the type of an existing column, so really all I can do is add more columns. Um, and if you look at, at data sets at LinkedIn, and really if you look at data sets at any company that, that's been around for more than a couple of years, you'll find data sets with lots of vestigial tails, right? Like, um, uh, you know, a good example is there are data sets at LinkedIn which will have um, you know, more than one column called time. Uh, and you know, one of these columns might be in milliseconds, another might be in seconds. Uh, one of them has been deprecated, but it's hard for downstream yeah. consumers to know which is which. Um, so in order, and, and, and you know, this, this, this leads to a lot of like um, duplication, it leads to a lot of confusion, right? Because you have uh, data sets where many of the columns have been deprecated, right? Uh, and it, it's, hard to, it's hard to track that and it just leads to a big mess. So there's a lot of tech debt, right? That, that you get um, in these data sets. So um, it would be really nice, hypothetically, if you know, we go back to that sort of uh, data sets or services or microservices analogy. It yeah, be, it's really interesting. If we could version the APIs of these data sets, right? Oh. And if we could support more than one version of the API on top of the data set at the same time without having to make multiple copies of the data set, each with a different schema, right? So if you just look at a table, right, the, the API is fixed to the data. It's fixed to the implementation yep. of that table, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's tightly coupled. But what we want is this level of indirection so that we can support multiple APIs, multiple versions of the API on top of the data set at the same time. And that's what views give us. That's what I was just about to say. That sounds like a view. It's yeah, like, exactly. it's, it's, a, it's like a different version of it, but it's, it's, I, I, it is the same thing. It's, it's from the same source. That's interesting. Okay, exactly. I like that. A so data set do, like a microservice. Right, so then what we do is we, we, every time someone makes a change to a view, we publish a new version of a view to our catalog service. And the, uh, the name of the view basically then is appended with the version number. And if you um, show basically the, or list the views in our catalog, you'll see multiple different versions of the same view. And this turns then um, the upgrade process, right? Ordinarily, if you make a change to a table, it's like a force push, right? You're, you're pushing that change to everyone at the same time. So there's the potential to break everyone at the same time. Uh, and it basically precludes you from making any backward incompatible changes because you would break everyone, right? Oh, um, by, by using views to control the API, we're turning an atomic push into an incremental pull. So it gives the people who depend on that view a window of time in which to you know, migrate from version one to version two, and then we can deprecate version one and, and toss it away. Um, and we also, in addition to um, the, the version views, we also provide a, a pointer to the latest view. So if you want to basically just uh, pin yourself to the latest version, um, and you know, ride that wave. Uh, you have the the ability to do that as well. You feel like a rebel. Yeah, you feel like you're on <laughs> on an adventure. Well, you're living on the edge. You're yeah, the, exactly. See, so, yeah, I'll go for it. I'll be the beta tester, or the alpha tester, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, this is this is super interesting information about how it works. I've always kind of been thinking about. You over the years, you've been at LinkedIn for a while now. What was it? Seven years? Seven years. And so over these years, I'm sure you've seen design structures change like heavily. Or has it been something that you've chosen a route and you've kind of stuck with it? And then there's been little iterations off to the side. Well, really, I mean, I would say that that um, over the last seven years at LinkedIn, that it sort of mirrors the you know, larger industry in general, which is really this, uh, uh, you know, dawning understanding that um, when uh, Hadoop emerged, we sort of threw the baby out with the bathwater, right? There was this this reaction, right? That like SQL is bad, uh, databases are bad. Here's like the new school way of doing things. You know, it's freedom, it's democracy, all, all of that great stuff. Um, file systems, 
you know, are, are, are the way to go. Um, and, and this notion, right, that uh, everyone should have direct access to the lowest level details possible uh, in the system, because that's, that's freedom. Um, but uh, it's, it's a travesty, right, for ordinary users to ask people to manage all of these details that are really irrelevant uh, to their day to day, right? Like, why should I have to know um, where uh, a data set is stored on HDFS? Why should I uh, uh, be responsible for figuring out how it's partitioned uh, and laid out over the file system and uh, be responsible for knowing like what format it's in and how to deserialize that format into your records, right? Um, so I think it appealed at the time to a certain audience of people, primarily like software engineers who suddenly found themselves doing data engineering, but it made absolutely no sense to people um, who had been sort of already part of the data engineering industry up to that point and who really just wanted SQL, they wanted tables, they wanted views. Um, and, and yeah, I, I would say that like the, the last seven to 10 years have sort of been defined by, um, you know, everyone taking a, a major jump backwards and then incrementally sort of uh, moving over to this, this more sane environment. And you really see that also with um, uh, this paper, right? That the, the folks at Andreessen Horowitz wrote um, where they're uh, describing, you know, this emerging uh, data architecture for um, big data. And I, I think, you know, if I had to summarize the theme, it's things are looking more like a database once again um, in the good ways. But it's like a scalable database, uh, which hopefully you know retains a lot of the flexibility that um, uh, many of these technologies you know sort of introduced, let's say, ten years ago. This is, uh, I think, a nice segue into some of the things we wanted to talk about with respect to the article. So, the emerging architectures article talks about this unified infrastructure architecture. Can we talk a little bit about? What that means and and how that relates to uh, some of the trends that you're seeing going you know moving away from file systems to i guess a database again um and yeah how does that relate to just the, the entire landscape because again i think there's a lot of different use cases right like for an ml application the way that you use the data may be a little bit different from other you know other software um so yeah i'm interested to hear how that relates to this unified infrastructure it seems like it's a bit tricky to make them all work since everyone yeah. has different needs so um I'm a little hesitant actually to try to summarize the article because I think the way that I would summarize it is maybe different from from the way that other people would summarize it. And maybe Fair I should enough. also clarify, like, so uh, for for your listeners, right? So there's this uh, article or essay, which is really well done, by the way. I recommend everyone take a look at it. Yeah. Um, written by some folks at Andreessen Horowitz. And I was, um, I guess, a consultant on it along with a bunch of other people. So uh, I think they... Um, they did little interviews with a bunch of people and then tried to synthesize like what are the common themes um, that we see here. I think the the big question that's posed in this article um, is are uh, data lakes and data warehouses fundamentally different things or are they actually on a path towards convergence where um, a data warehouse and a data lake are going to be one and the same. So um, a data warehouse, uh, you know, quick description, it's basically like a, a SQL analytic database, right? Like you load um, all of your uh, data into your data warehouse, and then you're able to query it uh, using SQL. And that's um, sort of the bread and butter of data analysts and um, data engineers. Uh, a data lake is sort of like, um, it's the it, it, it's what Hadoop and Spark have become, right, over time. So the idea is that you throw your data onto a disaggregated storage layer like S3 or um, yeah, ADLS, S3 or GCS, like yeah. Exactly. And you don't worry too much about the format, right? It could be CSV, TSV, binary JSON, Parquet, or the files. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, anything really. Or it could just be blob data um, or or unstructured data, which is a term I actually hate because uh, obviously I mean data without structure is entropy, right? So there's always structure there. It's just a matter of um, yeah, yeah. figuring out what it is. Um, and then once you have it uh, uh, under storage layer, you have a variety of different tools that you can use to analyze that data. So um, unlike in a data warehouse where you expect that there is this coupling, right, between um, storage and the execution layer and the language that you're allowed to, to analyze it in the the data lake, it's it's freedom, right? You could use Spark, you could use um, Presto SQL, uh, Beam, stuff like that. So um, 
so you know going back like i said data warehouses right it's it's uh, a system right which um has sort of looked the same way at least in terms of apis right for 20 years at this point probably more um data lake uh is sort of what appeals to data scientists right so another good way of sort of um describing these things is that you know, there, there are two big players right now uh, in this industry, if you will. There's Databricks and Snowflake. And Snowflake, I think, traditionally has been going after the data warehouse um, market. So they are a cloud data warehouse. Um, their, their target market really is SQL analysts. Um, and like a data warehouse, it's understood that in order to analyze your data, you first of all have to import it into Snowflake, right? So you, you use Snowflake's proprietary um, format to um, store your data. With Databricks, right, it is a company that started um, going after this market of um, uh, data scientists, right? So people who are using a variety of different languages to analyze a variety of different types of data. Um, and, and as a result, you know, their stack is, um, it's decoupled it, to, to a great extent. Um, you have a lot of optionality at, at different layers in that stack. Um, Market wise, like these two companies are sort of on a collision course uh, because um, Databricks has very much captured the market for data scientists. Snowflake has very much captured the market for um, data analysts. And I think to continue to grow, each company has to go after the other company's market. So they're like two giant planets caught in each other's gravitational pull. And I think they're going to continue <laughs> to pull each other uh, closer and closer together. What a great and, way of looking at it. And, and we've we've really seen that um, even just over the past year. So Databricks, uh, I think in November, uh, had a big blog post about how um, I forget exactly how they messaged it, but but effectively, like if you um, their their platform now treats uh, data analysts as first class citizens in addition to data scientists. Uh, they acquired Redash, I think, a year ago, and Redash um, was a startup that provided this really nice. Um, you know, like hosted uh, IDE for developing SQL, similar to the really nice hosted IDE that Databricks already had for data scientists, you know, notebooks and things like that. So, so you know, clearly like they're, they're, they're trying to go after um, both markets. Uh, and similarly, I know from talking to people at Snowflake that um, Snowflake, I think, is working on their own programmatic API uh, that they're going to use to complement SQL um, and, and other things like that. So, um it's you know pretty interesting i think to, to see those those two players um yeah kind of merging. so my my thesis then is that uh data lakes and data warehouses are going to be one and the same at some near point in the future um and i'm going to pause here and ask if you guys have any questions or follow-ups yeah so that's awesome i think i was just going to ask about another trend that i've been kind of thinking about or noticing so I saw that BigQuery now is uh, adding a lot of functionality. So you can do ML on it. So it seemed like there's more advanced capabilities, but at the database level. Uh, the database level. Uh, one, so that you don't have to make any network calls. That's one advantage. There's a few different reasons why I, th I think people like it. But what uh, is that something that you see also elsewhere outside of just BigQuery or Google? Are also people thinking about making things more accessible at the database level so that you don't have to go and do all this data engineering to go get it? Yeah, so... You know, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, so people in the academic database community for like probably the last 10 years now have been saying that um, it's inevitable that people will start doing machine learning on databases. And not just that it's inevitable, but that's the right way to do it. Um, and, and they sort of, you know, look at um, the day-to-day the -day life of an ML practitioner and to them it looks like a mess. Uh, in the sense that um, you have lots of files, uh, uh, you know, basically like people are in a sense coding the database themselves instead of starting with this nice abstraction and this nice engine and, and layering on top of that. Um, I think another thing that the academic database community and, and really people even just in, in the industry database community um, have been pointing out is the databases are more than just SQL. Um, you know, the, the sort of like academic term for it would be relational database management system. And it's that data management system part, which I think a lot of people don't adequately yeah. appreciate. Um, yeah. The notion, right, that, that instead of thinking about files, you're able to think about uh, your data as data sets or tables. Um, you're able to apply fine-grained access controls 
uh, on top of those things. So if with a file system, right, it's very coarse grained. You could either read the file or you can't read the file. So you don't have any way of saying, hey, uh, Bob, um, I only want you to look at the following columns in this file, right? You, you can't do that. But if you have a table abstraction, you can do that. Um, if you have views layered on top, you can even do record level uh, access controls, where in your view, uh, you say, um, uh, you know, like, if the current user ID is part of this group, like filter these rows out. Um, so you can, um, you can apply these very like, you know, fine grained access controls. And I think that's actually kind of one of the almost paradoxes, like um, uh, finer locks actually lead to more sharing. Um, because if, you're, if your decision right is either to share all of it or none of it, in a lot of cases, chances are you're going to say, I can't share any of it, right? Hmm. But if you have the ability to, at a, at a fine-grained level, say, like, I want to share this little piece with this group of people, but not anything else, then, then you can share a lot more. Yeah, it's not all or nothing. Right, exactly. Um, and it, sorry, go ahead. Uh, that just kind of goes along with a, a trend that I've been seeing a lot lately, which is, like, RBAC and being able to say who gets permission to what and especially when it comes to data and how sensitive things can be, it's so interesting to have that question. And, and so it makes sense that this would be something highly valuable for, for people doing this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and that's, that gives us a great opportunity to talk then about one of the um, other sort of major things that Snowflake, sorry, uh, Databricks has done recently. So um, if you look like, let's go back in time to maybe 2008 or 2009 when cool. Yahoo opened. Source Almost iPhone Hadoop. time. <laughs> yeah. So, so Hadoop, you know, really at the time was a combination of two different things. It was a um, distributed file system called HDFS and a spec implementation, if you will, of a, an execution layer in, in the form of MapReduce. Um, and, you know, it's my personal feeling that HDFS as a file system, it's great, but what we needed at that time was not a file system. What we needed was a data set system. Um, because you know, quickly you run into problems with a file system if, if that is actually the, the API that you want people to use to manage petabytes of data, you run into issues because obviously your data set is going to be um, actually, it's not one file, it's a thousand files or 10 million files. Uh, and you have to come up with ways of how to um, partition that data set you know, over directories. And all of these things then become part of your API. Uh, and and you know, that adds additional complexity. And then also the fact that um, it's fundamentally impossible to support the kinds of um, role-based access controls that you would like on top of a file system, right? Going back to this issue of either you can read the whole file or you can read none of it. So ideally what we really want is a not, a, not a file system, what we want is a record system or a table system, right? Which instead of exposing files, it exposes tables. Uh, and instead of reading bytes, I read records. Um, and uh, if you look at sort of uh, like a, a parallel database, right? Something like Presto. If you look at the lower half of Presto, that's actually what Presto is. It is a record service um, where you have a bunch of workers that are talking to um, a, a distributed store. It could be S3 or ADLS or HDFS. And these workers are running as secure processes. So it's understood that they have access to all of the underlying data. And when you talk to one of these workers and you say, hey, I'm Carl, I'd like to read this table, the worker is responsible for figuring out, aha, this logical table name maps to this set of underlying files. And I know what the schema is in these underlying files. I know what the schema is of the table. And I know that Carl is only allowed to look at this one column because he's a putz and he's you know, not, not allowed to look at the credit card numbers or stuff like that. And moreover, I'm also going to apply a record level access control. So I'm going to filter out some records that Carl shouldn't look at either. Oh, wow. So these workers right, are really nice because they hide a lot of complexity from me. I don't have to worry about the underlying file format or how stuff is partitioned or any of that garbage, but also, um, if you're the administrator, you can make sure that Carl isn't allowed to see stuff that he's not supposed to see. So um, Databricks uh, has introduced um, their own 
uh, version of this record service. I forget exactly what they call it, uh, but it is, you know, a layer that sits in front of your disaggregated storage layer, like S3. And that then becomes the public API of people, like the lowest level public API for people running on Databricks. It's no longer S3. You're not talking directly to S3. Instead, you're talking to this, this intermediate layer. Another cool thing about that intermediate layer is it's a great opportunity to do caching. And yeah, yeah. one of the, the interesting things, um, especially to me, is that uh, data processing, especially the batch world, is very episodic. So at LinkedIn, if I see what's happening today, like the jobs that are running, the data sets that are being read, I can predict with almost 100% accuracy what's going to happen tomorrow and at what time. So there's a great opportunity then to um, pre-warm the cache with the data sets that you know are going to be read. Um, and there's some interesting also like cost optimizations that you can do. Um, if you look at, for example, Azure, uh, I believe that Azure's cost model, um, if you're reading from ADLS, you pay for IOPS there, but you don't pay for IOPS between um, nodes that you're actually running. So if you run your caching layer, uh, and you cache data sets there, data sets that you know are going to be read by more than one client, um, you can save on the IOPS. Uh, oh, basically, that's cool. You pay once to load them into your cache and then subsequently- And then just read from there. Yeah, yeah. okay, cool. Okay, so where are we? Uh, yeah, no, that was, uh, you said so many awesome things. So <laughs> just data works. Mind. Yeah, no, honestly, there's there's so many things that I think we're going to have to break this out into another session, Carl. So we're going to have to reach out. But um, I want to talk a little bit more about the security aspect of, of like data. You know, I, I feel like that's, that's something ML engineers or data scientists think too much about, but it is actually something that we've had a lot of like uh, working, like, for example, we've had a lot of challenges with um, having d multiple clusters and having different S3 buckets and access to like between those different buckets. So like, that's like typically where I like think about access or role based, you know, role based access controls to data. But it seems like this is actually not that it's not a solve. It's not like a, a solved problem. Um, I know that there are some tools around this space. Like, I don't know, maybe this may not be relevant. Like Kerberos, there are some tools around like, like if you're, I've seen that, for example, with Spark uh, with some integration with Kerberos. Uh, there are some challenges when you when you're trying to you know do, you do things like disaggregated compute uh, because it's like it, there's like the swap files or I forget what it's called specifically with Spark. But I know that there's some challenges when you have a distributed system and multiple workers, and then you have access specific access to specific places. So it seems like this is a really difficult thing. Right, right. So right, it's a, it's a complete mess, right? And uh, uh, Kerberos, <laughs> by the way, is a mess. Uh, it's, yeah, I was just reading about it. I'm like, man, this is pretty complicated. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's almost like the people who implemented Kerberos um, tried to make it baffling. Uh, the, the, the terminology is opaque. Um, I mean, even if you read like the RFCs about Kerberos, like uh, RFCs usually are pretty opaque, but like the Kerberos RFCs are, <laughs> they take things to the next level. Um, I actually had a friend at Cloudera who, um, took it upon himself to write a user guide to Kerberos. And that kind of made him famous within the company. Oh. Uh, and it was like our customers went nuts over this thing because uh, otherwise like setting up a Kerberized cluster was, um, I wouldn't say just a nightmare. It was almost an impossibility. And this guide, you know, sort of brought it down to, uh, you know, the, the level of a skilled, competent human. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I think that, that security gets easier, it becomes tractable when you stop giving people direct access to the file system or to the storage layer. And, and does that require a level of abstraction on top of the, the data yeah. of the file system? Yeah, it does. And, and that level of abstraction, right, is this table layer, this record layer. Um, mm -hmm. So once you impose that, um, that, that proxy layer, right, that sits between you and the bytes and um, so, you know, the API between the, the layer and um, disaggregated storage is files and bytes, but the API that exposes to you are tables and records or views tables and records. At that point, things become tractable. And also it gives your um, administrator the ability to express policies in terms of higher level constructs like views, tables, and columns, as opposed to having to worry about directories and files. 
And, and that's a dramatic sim simplification, right? And it also gets us to a model that's been working for 40 years. Um, it's really amazing, actually, if you go back and look at the original System R papers, like how much those folks got right, you know, right off the bat. Um, I, I, I recently read, um, it's not the original System R paper, but it's like a retrospective on System R written by the System R people uh, like in 1978 or something like that. And they talk about role-based access control. And uh, they talk about using um, views as an access control mechanism in order to uh, implement uh, row-based access controls. So all of this like futuristic stuff, like they figured out, you know, 40 years ago. And yeah, it's and been around for a while. Been around for a while, right? And it's like uh, it's like you know when um, when uh, data lakes were introduced, right? It's like we went back in time a little bit, uh, you know, jump forward and two major jumps. I see back what you're saying now. now. Yeah, catching up. I see what you're saying now. It's not to get too philosophical, but why do you think that is? Why do you think there's like these? I mean, I, I my my intuition is that like there's common solutions. Patterns form over time. We have a lot of similar problems, and you end up you know forming software patterns or design patterns for that. But why do we go back and go you know go forward? What what shifts these trends? I mean, there's probably a lot to that. Um, I'm sure just like you know, industry is a big driving force, right? Like the needs of the applications and what they're the problems that they're trying to solve. I, I'm sure that before, even though they were talking about this, maybe it wasn't like applicable or relevant. You couldn't really use. It. I'm thinking about like when neural networks were first talked about a while ago, right? Like we just didn't have the compute; it wasn't feasible. So it was yeah. just more of an idea than it was something that was actually useful. Even though it was a really good idea, and then fast forward, actually ended up having huge impact, right? In a lot of different uh, cases. Well, I think that um, uh, better. so there's actually, I think, an essay that, that does a good job of explaining trends like this. So there's this guy named nice. Richard Gabriel, um, who uh, is really well known in the Lisp community. He was one of the founders of a company called Lucid, um, which was making a, a Lisp IDE back in um, the 80s. Uh, he's also a really amazing writer. Um, so he wrote this essay called The Rise of Worse is Better. And uh, in it, he so he sort of wrote this at a time when his company was failing. Um, and also at a time when um, when C++ was starting to eclipse Lisp uh, in terms of, um, well, not just, not just popularity, but uh, sort of industry acceptance. Um, and people like in the 80s, this was sort of during the first AI wave, there were a lot of people who thought that Lisp was going to be the dominant programming language going forward. And for people in the Lisp community, it wasn't just a thought, it just seemed obvious to them, right? Like, why would people use C when they have Lisp, this high level- The uh, language of God. The language <laughs> of God. And, and, but also, I mean, a lot of research had been going into it and, and people um, you know, believed at the time that you could optimize Lisp just as well as you could uh, C++, right? So why would, why would anyone want to use C++ when you have this much nicer uh, environment? And you know, just for fun, like you guys should go and maybe watch some YouTube videos about the Symbolics uh, development environment. Symbolics was the uh, company that um, made Lisp workstations that were programmed top to bottom in Lisp. Um, and they uh, uh, had a development environment which was, you know, light years ahead of anything that was available at the time. So anyway, uh, Richard Gabriel, um, you know, writes this essay and he tries to explain why um, things that, you know, are demonstrably not as good as, as other things seem to succeed better. Um, and he, uh, he, he sort of, you know, articulates these two different approaches, which he calls the, um, the New Jersey approach and the MIT approach. Uh, and the New Jersey approach really is a stand in for Bell <laughs> David, Labs. Be careful, David's in New Jersey right now. So, <laughs> all, all good, no worries. Yeah, so, so I, I should say that like New Jersey is really just sort of a synonym here for Bell Labs. Um, so the, these two different approaches to engineering. And he says like the MIT approach um, is that the, um, uh, that the, the implementation that it's the, of paramount importance, importance is that the interface is as simple and as consistent as possible and that it is okay um, to uh, complicate the implementation if necessary. So if, if, a, if a complicated implementation is necessary to provide a simple and consistent interface to users, that's okay. 
the New Jersey approach is basically that the, um, the interface should be as simple and consistent as possible, unless that leads to unnecessary complexity in the implementation, in which case you can expose the complexity to the user. Yeah, that's a good point because sometimes trying to be super simple, you actually make it more complicated. Right. Or for yourself, I, I've done that to myself, shot myself in the foot where I'm like, oh, I have this nice simple modular thing and then it's just like over-engineered and now it's way more complicated to extend it, to change it, to do anything. So I've definitely exactly. been there. <laughs> exactly. So, so Gabriel then goes on to say that like Lisp is basically an example of, of the MIT school of design, right? Where this very nice interface oftentimes leads to a very complicated uh, implementation. Um, and C++ is a good example of the worse is better approach where you have uh, an interface, right? The C++ programming language, which is okay, uh, but it has a much simpler implementation than your average like version of common Lisp. Um, and we can think of a bunch of other examples. So here's two really example, interesting examples of where worse is better breaks down. Some interesting counter examples. So one counter example is search, okay? Search has uh, a very, like, and I'm talking about Google, for example. So the implementation of Google search is probably the most complex thing, you know, on the planet, right? And that's necessary in order to provide a dirt simple interface. Just type some stuff in and it will show you the results mm -hmm. that you want. Yeah. Okay. Another good counter example is databases. Okay. So a lot of complexity in, in the implementation of the database goes into being able to support this declarative interface, right? Like you don't have to tell me how to join tables together. Just tell me the join that you want, right? Like basically tell me what I'm looking for and I'll go find it for you. Give me some rules, in other words, about uh, the you know rules to satisfy and I will go and show you the records that satisfy those rules. That's basically what SQL is, right? You don't have uh -huh. to tell me how to like, how to find those, the database takes care of it for you. So actually also going back to worse is better for a minute. So, so Gabriel's observation is that, that the worse approach seems to be more commercially successful. Right, like C++ was way more commercially successful than Lisp. Um, uh, uh, Unix was may, way more successful than VMS. Uh, th there are other, you know, sort of examples of this. Um, so, so his conclusion is that uh, the thing that provides 90% um, of what people want and which is available right away and which will incrementally approach the better thing over time um, is the thing that's more likely to succeed because it will spread like a virus. Whereas mm, the, the right thing, the right approach will often um, get to market you know, after the fact, it will be a little bit too late um, and it will take a long time to get right. Uh, so so that's, that's that. But like I said, there are counter examples, those counter examples being search and databases. Mm. And I think that that's really what's been happening over the last 10 years with Hadoop, like Hadoop is a great example of worse is better. Um, it was 90% or 80% of what the people using it actually wanted or needed. The irony is that a lot of the people who were using it thought that they wanted it without realizing uh, all of the, um, I mean, it was like a, a whole population of people who were addicted to self-harm, right? And they, they, didn't, they didn't know, right, that they were hurting themselves. They thought, ah, oh, this is freedom. But, but really, I mean, it was just creating a mess for themselves and, you know, for the person sitting next to them. And, and now I think that, that over the last 10 years, we've seen um, what was worse at the time incrementally approaching better by adopting um, the design and the architecture incrementally of, of database systems. Makes total sense. Well, I think we've hit the top of the hour. I want to say a big thank you, Carl. You just blew both of our tops right off. And we're going to have to go and and really like review and study everything that you just said here because there's so much wisdom, so many different nuggets. And I, I just got to say thanks. Thanks for coming on here. Thanks for doing this with us. Yeah, My pleasure. It was... Yeah, if you know, be re we you, we could talk about this offline, and we'll send some links into the the coffee session. Um, but if you have any resources that really helps you get a sense of some of these things, like that article, uh, you know, I, I think that's really great. Anything like that that you think would be helpful for to help us better understand uh, some of the things you talked about today would be really great. I'm going to share the link to this uh, rise of worse is worse better. Is Sounds better. super. 
Yeah, it sounds super interesting. Can't wait to read that today. And yeah. uh, yes, honestly, you said so many really good things. Uh, we're definitely going to be reaching out to you to uh, extend this. And uh, we really, yeah, again, just once again, thank you for taking the time to inform us and teach us. Very Appreciate cool. it. Yeah. It's been my pleasure. And then just a quick plug. Um, we've got a couple yeah. of posts on the LinkedIn engineering blog about Dolly, the, the system that I've been working on, the oh, nice. um, uh, transpiling views and whatnot. So I'll make sure that you nice. guys get the links and can put them in the... Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely will and you do. Said that, that's about transpilers, you said? Uh, it's about uh, translating. Uh, we also talk about transport, which is our UDF framework, and oh, okay. um, and uh, taking software engineering principles and applying those to data engineering. So we've got, I think, three different blog posts. That sounds nice. awesome. Nice. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. This has been an awesome one, uh, coffee session. We hope you guys have a awesome rest of the week, and yeah, we wish you all well. Peace, guys. See ya later. Sweet.